Hello, this movie will discuss a use of size distribution tool from IRENA. This is a new version of size distribution tool which has been uh, developed during basically May and June 2018 and it is for IRENA version 1.67 or later. It will be included in a regular release which is planned for July 2018. It is already available at the time of recording in a June 2018 beta release. Um, and to install that in IRENA you need to download the IRENA installer, the GH installer from the IRENA website. Uh, when you run it uh, if you need to install the June 2018 release, um, beta release, then what you do is you select include beta releases in list, you install June 2018 release as the one which you want to install. If you use multiple packages, you want to reinstall all packages you use. So for example, if you have both Irina and Nika, you need to reinstall both at the same time. Now, if you are installing later and July 2018 or any later release is available, you can just install the regular later release. There's no problem. Now, <coughs> how do you find out you have the new tool? Well, if you look on the panel for the size distribution tool, the panel differs in the way that looks like inside here. In these background parameters, they are different. There's a lot more parameters in here, so I'm going to discuss how to use those also now. So <clears throat> now we know how to get the data, uh, how to get the, uh, the tool. Let's talk about when it's usable. So this tool is usable only under specific conditions. It makes some assumptions. Every tool in modeling makes assumptions. In this tool, the first assumption is that all scatters are the same shape. Uh, there's only a limited number of shapes which makes any sense to be used because one, it's, it's, everything is a as, as is noted here uh, if you have a sufficiently polydispersed systems basically everything is a sphere so the most typical shape is a sphere uh, you can use a, a spheroid with a specific aspect ratio if you need it but anything more complicated than this tool is probably not suitable all scatters must have the same contrast so they're made out of the same material so for example they can be pores or they can be precipitates or they can be anything else but at any given time there should be just one type of them if you have a mixture of different scatters this tool cannot distinguish between them it is meant for polydisperse system and i have a note here about 30 percent polydispersity basically how do you find out there are no bessel function oscillations in intensity and i'll show you to you in a, in a second and then <coughs> this tool does not have a way to address any structure factor effects so this is for dilute systems only again a good news highly polydispersed systems exhibit dilute scattering behavior up to high concentrations so now let me show you what i mean by this so first thing is the way the tool works is it takes a form factor and this is a form factor for monodispersed spheres. This is how a scattering would look like for a single sphere. And you can see at Q, lower, Q, there's a guinea area here in this area. Um, then below that, the intensity goes flat towards whatever the proper value here is, the forward scattering. So there's a flat area here, even in case you can see it. You have a guinea, and then you have these Bessel function oscillations. So that's a monodispersed sphere. <clears throat> if you now have a polydispersed sphere, the shape changes. So let me put it down here. So, or actually it is in there, so I can see. So instead of the red curve, which has these sharp Bessel function oscillations, the polydispersity causes a little widening of the broader, of the guinea area here. So that guinea law is not purely and perfectly applicable anymore. Um, but it's close. Uh, the uh, Bessel function oscillations wash out, so you can see that you don't see them anymore. And at low Q, because it's still a dilute system, we still have an intensity going to Q0 as a straight line. Now, this would be an ideal data set for this tool. This is what the tool can measure. It can now reconstruct back the size distribution out of the blue curve. However, real data are usually more complicated. Number one complication is most of the time, we will have a flat background or some kind of background in the system. Now, <coughs> this 
flat background assumption has been built in the small size distribution tool for ages now so that is something which has been in prior versions too so you don't have to worry about that too much it's the same thing we need to subtract this flat background in order to reconstruct back the blue curve so we can do the proper fitting so that's and the first parameter which we're going to need to assume. However, things get even more complicated. Lots of times you will find out that there's also more scattering coming out of low Q. Typically there will be a beam stop somewhere here. And then you have data which just coming down on a log log plot. It's a straight line which tells you it's a power loss slope. And now <clears throat> if you don't account for this power loss slope coming down, then you have a problem that any fit done to the data here in this area will also include scattering from this area. Usually it's not a major problem, but again, the, new, the, the tool should account for it somehow. That's where the upgrade of the, this tool was this time. So this actually now, this new version of side distribution allows you to account for this. So we can handle data which look like this, where we have a flat background, low Q power loss slope, and some kind of scattering over that. We can handle that now in that new size distribution tool relatively easily. Now, which data it still cannot handle? Here we have the red data. And the red data is the polydisperse system. There is no low Q power loss slope. What there is, it's a structure factor. So what it, what happened is there's a there are some repeated distances, a highly concentrated system. It's about 25% concentration. So there's a hard spheres model. And what you find out is that the intensity at low Q decreases, and what used to be a guinea area, blunt guinea area, is now looking more like a peaky shape. Any data like this, and you have to use more complicated tool, you cannot use a size distribution tool in IRENA. So, let's now go here, and I'll be working in Windows. <coughs> there are, oh, let's go back. Um, one thing here, the data for this movie, so you can repeat what I'm doing here, are available on the IRENA webpage which you can find here. There is a link for it, which is named like this, Side Distribution Tool Test Data, which links to GitHub Igor Experiment. And another note, uh, for the USEX data, which are in there, the contrast is about 90, so you can then get the proper calibrated data. So now let's go here. First thing is, let's get the Igor Experiment. To do that, we're going to type in Google Ilovsky Irina. Good enough. And hit Enter. And then the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to find the web page, typically first or second one. Out here are releases and everything else. And as I said, there are various test data for tools, and that's size distribution tool test. You're going to just click on that link and say save file, and it saves the file. The file has been saved in my downloads folder, so I'm going to take it and put it on the desktop. Okay. Now the next thing what I need to do is start Igor Pro. This for uh, this I'm going to run Igor Pro 8. You can run in Igor Pro 7 for now. Uh, it doesn't matter. So in here I just started Igor. I'm just going to go in and open experiment and I'm going to open size distribution test experiment. When that happens, you're going to find out in data browser. If you don't see data browser, go in and find it here in data, data browser. You're going to find here that there are few folders. And <coughs> the SAS folder is a folder created by ASCII importer in IRENA. So if you have ASCII data or other data, it will create a folder called SAS. I will stick in their test data. Inside the test data, we have three different waves. Um, the Q and a name represents a scattering vector. R and a name is an intensity. S is an uncertainty for intensity. So this is what is called QRS data, which the IRENA understands. A different type of data, which you can have also, if you measure it on a USAX instrument, are here. Again, there is a USAX. That's from USAX instrument. These, this is the name of the sample. If you click on that inside there, you have a uh, sum prefix under bar Q vector. That's a scattering vector. Intensity, uncertainty, and it's a Q resolution. We don't, in, in size distribution, we don't use Q resolution, so that's ignored. 
Okay, and so I gave you here a bunch of data sets so we can play with them and you have these. So now we have the data. <coughs> what we want to do is load Irina. When you load Irina, you will end up with having a SAS many here after compile. And so now these are all the different sub programs of Irina. If I select plotting tool, I can then go in and get a panel. I can select the two IDATA as QRS and I can find the test data. So QRS, select data, it will refill this automatically and then add data. Now you can see here, this pretty much resembles the data set we had before, which was, move that out, move that out, that out and you can see that this is pretty similar to what we had before so we're looking on a polydisperse system there are no vessel function oscillations we're looking on flat background you can see that's here that's that and we're looking on some kind of low q power loss slope in this case this low q power loss slope represents some kind of uh, large features in the system and it's not obvious which ones. Let's presume these are powders. Let's presume that there are some really big rocks in there and this is a small angle scattering specific surface area of that thing. So now we know what we are looking at. It's critical to understand where different of these features are coming from your scattering. What do they represent? What their contrast is? What their shape is? And everything else. So Let's kill that, let's kill that, and let's get a size distribution tool. So now again, it's my size distribution tool. If you need to make it larger or smaller, drag this cursor around here. And then, by the way, it will reopen in that position after, if you close it and reopen it, it will reopen. If it's too large or inconvenient, hold down a shift key while you are reopening it. So if you go this, it opens its, its, its smallest dimension. And then you can sh zoom it up to larger size. So first thing is we're gonna use test data. So up here is a data selection that you get USEX choice and QRS or QIS, which is something which the NIST package has used and it's not very common. Now <clears throat> you can click on the type of data if you don't select one, you get a mess. So you want to select one of these. And then out here, you want to select the test data. These things get filled. So that's an X wave is a Q, Q vector. Y wave is an uh, R vector. And uh, error wave is an S. And then you just simply hit graph. And you get the curve. Now, <clears throat> if you have lots and lots of data, you can put a folder match string here so you can type in something in there which will limit which folders you can see here if you need help hit the get help button it will open an online manual for irena which you can then read okay um, if the data would be slit smeared uh, USEX does come with slit smear data and so it will switch on and off the slit smearing as needed uh, if you have slit smear data from somewhere else, you can check the checkbox, you get a slit length, you can fill the slit length. Um, that's your job. Okay, so now we are that. The first thing what we need to do is decide what sizes are we going to study. Uh, basically, the data which you have already have a size scale associated with them is a 2 pi over the Q range which you have. So if we are looking at a maximum Q out here, if we would take that and say 2 pi over this Q value here, which is uh, 0 .0, 0 0.6 or so, if we take that, that would give us the minimum size um, which we can see. Um, just go in and type in 10 here for now, that's fine. Again, the same thing applies here at low Q. If you do a 2 pi over this value, you get a maximum size. So just add two zeros in here. Number of bins in diameter, that's number of sizes which the code will presume are used. Um, 100 is fine. Um, you can go 200, 300. 
Um, if you have such a large range of sizes, minimum 10 and maximum 10,000, if you use linear binning, uh, the bins will be all on a large side and you will have no resolution at small size. So then logarithmic binning is the right thing to do. If you have a narrower size distribution, let's say um, from 500 to 1000, you can use linear binning if you want. So that gives us a selection of sizes we're going to use. The next thing what we need to do is go back and somehow build a background curve, which is going to take care of this low cupo low slope and this uh, flat background at the end. So we can see the flat background here. You can now go in and select a decursor, a low and start and end of a region in which your data is dominated by the flat background. You can use this fit flat background button. And you do that, this, this flat background here, that's it, the value of the flat background, that's now represented by this red dotted curve, is fitted to the data here. So that way we just got the flat background. Of course, you can also type the number in if you want. The next thing is we can go in and deal with this low Q power loss slope. And to deal with that, we can look on the first few points and we can make a decision um, about the power loss slope here. So here is a, a, this is part of basically unified. If you look on a unified fit, if you know how to use it, B is a prefactor. Uh, P is a power law slope. If the P is equal 4, that is a Porot slope. So it's Q2 minus 4. That would be here. And that way, the B would be a Porot constant. So if we make assumption that the Porot law is obeyed, so presuming the sample has a smooth surfaces inside, which come from something really, really large, then we can keep the P at a 4 and then have something here and you can see what it does it puts a power law slope here and I can do minus six and I can keep going down for example like that and with this I have already dialed up the numbers which I want to have here and I'm basically saying these data this small angle scattering in this area is sitting on top of this background here and there is some scattering coming out of the low Q, which is represented by this power law slope. In order to do this correctly, I need to know what the source of the power law slope is. And if I, as I said, I presume in this case, there are some large rocks which have relatively smooth surfaces. So there's some specific surface area coming out of that. Now <clears throat> you can select this Q range here and you can fit. So there are two buttons here. If you fit low QB, all you're doing is you're simply fitting this one parameter while holding the P equals whatever the number is. If you then fit both of those, the other one, then what you get is you get a power law slope fit at the same time. And you can see this is actually not a bad fit here. That actually seems to resemble that quite well. There is gonna be difference in here and what is correct strongly depends on what the source of the scattering at low Q is. If the Porot's law is obeyed, then you need to force this to be 4, because that's the Porot's law, and then just do a fit of the Porot constant. If that source is not a Porot, but possibly a surface fractal or something else, uh, then you need to know what that something else is and fit it correctly in order to get correct data at high Q. So now what we did is we now have underlined the data with a, a, a presumption, our presumption of uh, the background. Keep in mind, this will impact the results which you have. And so a typical thing in publications is you should really have a justification for what you have done here. Uh, if you send a paper for review to me, I will ask, why did you do this on not something else? Because without justification, you just cooked up some garbage data. Anyway, so the next step is we can select the range of data with the cursors from here to there. These are the data which are dominated by the scattering of particles which you want to analyze. 
Next, we have to decide how are we going to model these. There are few choices for using uncertainties. This tool requires uncertainties in order to work. If your data came with an error, uncertainty, error wave, then you can use the user errors. If it comes without it, you need to somehow fake it. In order to fake it, you can use either square root. That's very, very rare to be used because few instruments produce data which actually follow Poisson statistics. You can use percent error. That works usually quite well. And I suggest that if you don't have user errors, then use the percent errors. If you want to use total non-negative least square, this method here, you can use no errors too here and it kind of works. Then here goes the contrast. Uh, these are powders. Uh, they're not calibrated, so we're not going to bother about contrast. On the next step, which I'm going to show you, we will bother about that. And then uh, this tool will fit the data within uh, the um, within the error bars. So in order to fit this better, let's just give it a factor of 10, and that will increase the error bars. That way, the tool will find a fit much easier. You're going to understand in a second why. Particle shape models, there are a few, spheroid, cylinder, and cylinder with aspect ratio. I'm going to remove these for the release version anyway. So you have, and a typical use is a spheroid with aspect ratio 1, which is a sphere. If you know you have needles, you can use needles with whatever aspect ratio is. My strong suggestion is get good TEM or a CM or something else which tells you what it is. If you need help, there's a button here which opens up help. Um, so this gives you what type of particle shape you are doing, and we're going to be playing with these parameters. Here are three methods. Um, these methods are used to basically pick one of many, many, many solutions. Keep in mind that in small angle scattering, very, very rarely, and only in unique conditions of monodisperse systems, we have one single solution. Most of the time, we have just infinite number of solutions, which are semi somehow similar. Maximum entropy is the one which works quite well, and most often, it basically picks the noisiest solution. It's a method which is used for reconstruction of lots of other shapes and, and, and pictures and, and everything else. Um, the regularization next to it works sometimes, and it's used to pick a smoothest possible solution. And then the uh, total non-negative least square internal point gradient method is here. That works better when your data are somehow uh, more monodisperse. So max entropy is for highly polydisperse systems. Regularization is when you want to have a really smoothest possible solution. Uh, if your samples are a narrower size distribution, you can use this. Just don't combine them together. And sometimes it's worthwhile to just look and how all of those three solutions look like and, and play with them. Uh, and then what that tells you is what the variability of the result is. So the next thing is we're going to do a fit. We're just going to hit the fit button here. And it will, the blue curve is now the fit. So in this curve, the green are the original data. The red squares inside there are the data after subtracting the background. And then the blue curve is the fit curve. Now, uh, first thing is when this suggested background here changes, simply hit set. And that will, that's an internal parameter which needs to be changed in that case. By the way, if you cannot reach a solution, if it just doesn't fit, uh, then you may want to make this parameter much smaller. It depends on what the intensity values here are, and it's very difficult to estimate any other way. The next thing is we want to look at this and see this bar up here. It is actually called trust indicator. The way it's established is by looking at the Q-min. If you look at the Q-min and do a 2 pi over Q, or actually I think it's a pi over Q, in this case, you will get approximately this position. That tells you that you can see only particles which are smaller than about this Q. Now, in small angle scattering, you can kind of see behind the beam stop, so that's why it's kind of washed out. In any case, your Q value which you have here tells you that anything larger than 10 to the 4 even if it would be there, you cannot trust it. So let's go back and reduce the maximum diameter to 10 to the 4 in here. And the same thing you can do here. That's 10, 20, 30. So you can see that the Q max where your data are still meaningful here is approximately giving you like 20, 25 
and you cannot trust anything beyond that. And then what we can do is we can just take the error bars down and do a fit again. And you can see that it fitted, it fitted quite well. So let's just take the error bars down even more. And by the way, watch this number here. See that 10? I'm gonna do another one. That's now 12. So as you are changing the number here, you are squeezing the error bars down. You're making them smaller and smaller. You're letting the code know that it has to get the data better fitted before it can stop. And you're also using more of these iterations. And we're 14. And if you keep squeezing this down at some point, you will probably not be able to fit at all. I mean, it's going to go on and on and on and on and on. And up here, you can see the chi-square is just ridiculously high. It will never reach the 82. So there are limits. And if you would actually plot a, let me put this back in 1.3 or so and fit. That's, that just about works. That's a 30. So this number of iterations depends on the multiply errors. And the problem with errors is they're always estimates. They're not really perfect uncertainties for the data anyway. And so um, what you will find out is if you relax this number, uh, the number of iterations drops down quite quickly. So if you look on the dependence on number of iterations, uh, on this number, the multiplication of errors, you will find out that the number of iterations is typically about 10 to 12 or so until you reach a specific number, then it starts slowly growing until at some point just skyrockets. And so my suggestion is just, you know, find an appropriate one, which is working hard enough, but it's not overdoing that. And it's very difficult to say what is the right number. My typical number, which I'm getting on my data, is somewhere between 15 and 20. If it goes 25, 30, the limit is 100. It gets ridiculous. Anyway, and so now what we have is, let me just do that, and this gives slightly more pleasing results. What you see is a bimodal size distribution. So you have a size of smaller particles, which are around 100 angstroms, between 100 and, let's say, 200, 250 angstroms. And then you have something which is about 1,000 to 2,000 angstroms. These are diameters of the particles, as you can see up here. Uh, so this gives you a, a estimate on how that looks like. You can try the other methods. You can change here and fit. And what you get is you get a very smooth fit. These uh, satellite bumps are quite known. It's kind of ringing out of the method. So um, I don't know how much you can trust these, but you get these beautiful two very smooth curves. If you go to internal point gradient and do an internal point gradient, you can build a similar curve. So what that tells you is each one of these methods is going to get slightly different result based on their presumption. What is the best way to pick the most likely solution? I'm going to pick back this one and we're going to do this. Okay. <coughs> So that would be nearly done. What you can do with it, you can paste this into a notebook. Arena will create a notebook for you, which is a internal Igor a text document. You can type in here, you can add stuff in here, you can make notes. Um, that itself is useful, and I strongly suggest you keep notes as you are doing the fits in there. The other way, the better way how to store data is store in data folders. So what you do is you click in here, you can type in whatever you want. And what that has done is inside the SAS test data folder, now it adds in that results. And what you get is you get a the blue curve, which is the fit, intensity, and a Q vector. So you get a scattering vector and intensity. Those are these two. And then you get a diameter wave. So that's your bind. Those are these, these diameters here. Those are these bars get a diameter wave, and then you get a volume distribution, number distribution. What are they? Let me just plot that. Plotting tool. I want to do Irina result. I want to go here, and I'm going to do a diameter, and that's a volume distribution. And just change that into a volume distribution. And then what you're looking at is 
this is let me just walk x so this is this green curve and it's the same thing and this represents for each one of these bins in sizes so there are these bins in sizes these points here each one of these points represents that one bin one bar and that's that represents a volume fraction volume of the particles in there so this is um, this is a volume fraction in that narrow bar and each one of these bars has a width so each one of these bars is basically a size range and so that's a volume of particles in that given size range the other thing which you can have is you can have a number distribution if you do add data on that you will let me just kill that and add data you will get a different similar graph but now what you get is you get a number of particles that's a number of particles if your data are on absolute scale it's a number of particles per one centimeter cube of your sample and that size range so that's why this is also divided by an angstrom so it's in that size range and what you can see is it's totally different looking than the volume size distribution that makes lots of sense the size of the particle here is much smaller than the size of the particle here so this smaller volume of particles is a lot more of these particles so that's a volume and volume is weighted towards the large particles a one large particle may have a lot of volume in it whereas lots of small particles may not on the other hand the other way around is if you do a number of particles then you this thing here is going to look like this and the large particles are going to be nearly negligible in their volume which one is important well it depends on a science what is it you want to do it's very difficult to say ahead of time what is it you want to do with the data but if you are doing porosity measurement <coughs> and comparing with mercury intrusion porosimetry most likely you want to do volume distribution if you are comparing with image analysis most likely you need to do a number distribution so every technique for measurement of these porosities gives you slightly different results now one more thing this is a distribution but you don't know how uncertain you are about each one of these bins so even so the first thing is there's an uncertainty due to different methods so each one of these methods is going to get you a different solution there's also an uncertainty caused by the fact that your data have input errors and because of these input errors then basically the noise on the data you can ask a question how much that impacts your results and to do that you simply can hit this button here what that does it will run the same fit 10 times but what it does in between each fit it adds to your data a gaussian noise on the level of your input uncertainty when you finish up you then get a same size distribution so you get 10 different size distributions they are all average to give you one type one size distribution like this and these are statistical standard deviations for those bins so they get you also an estimate what is the uncertainty of the volume in each one of those bins depending on your um on your uh, uh noise on the data from the measurement itself and again you can store the data in folder and you will get actual size distribution win and uncertainty on that okay so this is now test data number one what i can do next is i can click here and i can say i want to have a different data set this is a USAX data set these data came from the USAX instrument in this case it's a piece of metal with precipitates in it which we were annealing for a long time so what I want to do is uh, first thing is I can go in and I want to extend the range of sizes again I can go and now I can fit this with the power law slope and let me try this here is an interesting first thing is I don't believe this slow Q bend here for various reasons up here what you can see is that the power law slope is approximately 3.83 it's it's not exactly 4 if you do 4 it's not gonna be a perfect fit it's gonna be slightly steeper than that um, it's not obvious where it comes from uh, let's keep it 4 for now uh, but it could be 
it may not be totally correct. Um, it, it depends. This could be scratches on the on the on the foil, on the metallic foil we were measuring. It could be grain boundaries. It could be lots of other things. So we don't necessarily know. Um, but we'll keep it at four for now and do this. The next thing is we're going to do the background and we're going to go all the way up here and simply hit flip background. Okay. So now we have a range of data. We can select a range of data we want to fit. If you know, if you remember my note, which I made, this thing has a contra about 90. So I'm going to type in a 90. If you need to calculate the contrast, the way you do that, you go in and get a scattering contrast calculator. You build your two components in here and you calculate the contrast, possibly anomalous, depending on what you are doing. Okay. And I have selected a range of data which I want to fit. I can increase the error bars and I can fit and I get something. I can do this and fit again and then squeeze again and try to do a fit again. Okay. So what I'm getting is I'm getting a fit on the leftover curve here and I am getting a size distribution. Okay, we just went through it clearly that we don't need to go all the way up there. So we can again remove one of these zeros. Argumentatively, that should be fine. And we can do a fit and that looks perfectly fine. Okay, so this is not an unreasonable fit. Now, the problem is we have a series of these things. And so if you look on, let's say, the latest one, what you'll find out is that in this area here, First thing is the background seems to be slightly off and this seems to be slightly off. And so what we now need to have is we now need to go in and tweak these parameters again. That gets very inconvenient because if you're doing series, it doesn't, you know, it's a lot of tweaking manually. So in order to do this, I build a little tool here. If you do fit, BP background on graph and this is the graph button which we use to basically put the data in there so I'm going to click on this what this allows you to do is select the range of data at low Q so where you're going to fit B or B plus P so I'm going to go in and I'm going to say I want to from here to here and I want to read the cues from cursors and I want to do a fit B when I do that, I have now selected a range in which I believe that across all of my samples, I can do a fit B and I'm going to tweak that. By doing this, every time you insert a new data set in the tool, it will automatically in this Q range optimize the B. Then I'm going to go up all the way here and there. And I'm going to read the cursors. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And that fits the Okay, so now what that does, it tells the code where I believe the flat background is, and I can go in here, and I can arrange these data. This is the range of data I want to fit, and I'm going to do a fit on that, and I got the fit. Okay, so if I now go back and say do this, I'm going back to the original. Notice the B is 1.05, and flat is 1.92. I'm going to do this. And as it imported the data, it automatically changed the B and the background and it set the cursors back. So all I need to do is go in and hit this and I'm going to get a fit again. So this way I can go in and manually skip lots of tweaking of the tool itself. I just put the data in. It automatically optimizes my background and front and I can simply do a fit. Okay, so that's still complicated because there's a lots of data I have. This is where the scripting tool comes in. Um, there is a description of the scripting tool manual, but anyway, what I can do is I can open a scripting tool. Let me just shrink it a little bit down so it's easier to see. I am going to use USAX data. I'm going to use USAX data. If I want to scale it down, I can make some match strings here and I can sort the data based on some uh, rules here. This is fine. I can uh, save the results in folders and notebook and I can select them all and then I can run 
with size distribution with no uncertainties. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the first one and run the unify uh, the uh, sizes, and it's going to take second one and so on. So you can see this is very convenient. It just does a fit, and then it does another fit, and it does another fit, and it always on the start of the fit, it always optimizes the B and background and does a fit and keeps doing that. It keeps adding also the results in the notebook so I can then follow them in a notebook and it saves them in my, in my data. So if I look in that now here, each one of these now has my fit. It has a diameters, intensity and so on. And now what I can do is I can go in and I can get a plotting tool. The plotting tool also can use scripting tools. So you want to watch the movie on that. I'm going to go in and you say I want to use USAX. I want to look in here at the results. I want to use size distribution. I'm going to fit the volume distribution. Select all data and run that. And then I'm going to go in here and say I have a volume distribution and I want to have log axes, take that somewhere sideways and vary the colors. And so, oh no, let's do rainbow. And so what you can see is that you can, you start with a bump in the middle and then you can see how the size distribution on this sample is changing as a function of time. So by combining together the, let me just kill that and kill that. By combining together the capability of this tool now to optimize the background parameters, the B, potentially P, and a flat background using the user selected parameters here, automatically, I can then use the scripting tool to characterize a huge range of samples very, very easily and very, very conveniently and everything is easy. If you don't want to do this setup, what you do is you just simply uncheck that checkbox and then it's your job to do a fit here, fit there, or just manually change those numbers as you wish. Okay, so I believe this documented in a very long way, I'm sorry about the length of it, uh, the capabilities of this tool. Um, this tool will be, as I noticed, released uh, released soon in a real release, but it's already available to you in June beta, 2018 beta release, which you can install now, or it will be in any later release, and that will be version 1.67 Irina or later. And if you have any questions, um, you can always uh, read the manual. That's the first thing what you want to do again. If you want to read the manual, just hit this button here. It will open your manual and then you can read through it and hopefully it's all in there. And if you run into major troubles and so on, I have courses once in a while or you can send me an email and I usually reply, even though, you know, when it's not smart question, you may get a snarky reply. Anyway, so that's it. Uh, thank you for attention and hopefully this tool will be useful for you in the future.